Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon or uh, good evening, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, my name is Rob Nixon. Many I've uh, met before, many I've not. But I am coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. It is 6.01 in the morning and it's dark outside. Uh, so it's all good. Uh, I want to know where you're, just so I can understand uh, if everything's working well, where you're coming from. So in the, in the chat box down the bottom, it says chat. I just want you to pop in there, hi from, just so we can see uh, where you're coming from and you can hear me okay. That is what I'm looking for. So hi from, let's just see if we've got some, in the chat box down the bottom, in your little thing, whatever you call it. Can you hear me? We've got some hands up, but why? No one's in the chat. All right, what does that mean? Hi from Germany, we've got one from Germany. All right, cool. So chat or questions, take your pick. Uh, no screen, I know, I've got just, here we go, here we go. All righty. We've got people from, I haven't started sharing my screen there. That's why you can't see a screen, you should just be able to see me. All right, so we've got New York City, we've got Leeds in the UK, oh, cool. Um, we've got California, Chapel Hill, Chapel Hill, uh, Queensland, Brett. Yeah, cool. Uh, Michigan, Sweden. Oh, Johnny Foster from Sweden. Go to Kuwait. Wow, Malta, Netherlands. Uh, hello, Ernst and Manuela. Uh, Lynn Gather, Victoria. Well, there you go. We've got them everywhere. New York City, Leeds, um, Gold Coast, Nigeria. Wow, Oklahoma, Quebec. Uh, we've got California. We've got uh, let's keep Redondo Beach. Love Redondo Beach, uh, Sherry. Uh, been there many times. New Jersey, Germany, uh, US, uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Brad, uh, Rob from Toronto, 10 p.m. here. Yes, at 6 a.m. here. Canada, Dunedin, New Zealand. There you go. Sweden, uh, another one from Kuwait. Wow, Kuwait. Uh, Vancouver, Canada, Moscow. Uh, Moscow, <laughs> there you go. Uh, Neela, lovely to see you again. I, last time I spoke to you, you were in Sydney. Uh, Oslo, Norway, Canada, more from Dunedin. Um, what's going on? Sweden again, another one from Kuwait. We've got three in Kuwait now. Uh, Oslo from the Golni, look at that. Well, welcome, 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 welcome. Let me just get a um, screen one clean. Cool. Let's just uh, get into this. And uh, I am super excited about bringing this to you today. Uh, this is going to be a great webinar because it's all about uh, you essentially becoming my version of what I call the wealthy accountant. Let me explain. So for 26 years, I've been working exclusively with accountants all over the world. Since May 1994, I've trained 185,000. Uh, I've uh, coached over 500, adding 900 plus million dollars in profit to them and written now four books. So book number one, I'm not sure you can see me on where, actually just so I can see because I prefer to use Zoom, but we're using this one today. Uh, can you see me on webcam? Uh, no, so that will share that there, that'll help. All right, cool, there we go. I'm actually in the clubhouse. Uh, the clubhouse is my, um, uh, my dwelling, if you will, for my for my golf course, and uh, that is not a green screen in behind. That's actually my wall of hats and also my um, uh, pool table. There's a hidden bar in there, all sorts of stuff. Anyway, so back back on track, back on track. Uh, so uh, books written. Uh, this one here called uh, Accounting Practices Don't Add Up: Why They Don't and What to Do About It came out in 2011. Uh, Remaining relevant: uh, The Future of the Accounting Profession came out in 2015. Uh, this one, The Perfect Firm in 17, and the new one called The Wealthy Accountant, all I have is this piece of paper. I don't even have the, um, you know, the full thing yet, the hard copy. It's getting printed right now. That's how new it is, and we've moved thousands of them. That's been great. And, and already, it's gone uh, number one uh, around the world in, in a few different sectors. Uh, it's gone number one in uh, business accounting in the US and the UK, number three in the UK. It's gone um, uh, number one in financial accounting in the USA and Canada, uh, Australia, sorry, number two in Canada. 
and number one in financial auditing in USA and Australia. So uh, brand new, it is brand new. You should all have a copy by now and you should all be uh, devouring, I hope, right? Uh, this webinar is all about you, it's a bestseller, becoming your version of the wealthy accountant. Subtitle, how accountants can make more than a million dollars profit per year while working less than 500 hours, right? So that's what we're gonna talk about. Today I'm teaching. Today for 60 to 90 minutes, why, why I say 60 to 90 minutes is because depending on how many questions you have will determine how long we go for, right? I've got about sort of 70 or 80 minutes of, um, of content, maybe 60, and then we've got questions from you in each segment. So I want you to get involved, right? This is a teaching uh, webinar. This is a gift to the profession, a gift to the readers of the, the, those who read the book, The Wealthy Accountant. Uh, by the way, if you haven't got a copy yet, you can certainly grab a copy. Uh, go to my website, robnixon.com, and get it there. Um, you can just download it, uh, I believe, for free at the moment. We are going to start selling it in, in May. Uh, but either way, this is um, to teach you some ideas to go a bit deeper into the book and also to uh, give you some help. So the more you get involved in the little question thing that you've got there that you've just had a try at, the more you get involved, the better this will be for you. I'm going to do this um, as we go uh, and I'm going to do it uh, live, right, as far as, um, you know, answering questions on the fly as well. So let's have a look at what you can expect when you implement, right? What you can expect when you implement is the following. Here's the average of the firms that I've coached. First of all, the starting mark average is 1.48 million, some smaller, some larger. Uh, typically, sort of 700,000 to a million we start at, um, and more than 5 million, this is direct coaching, this is not self-implementation. So direct coaching, where uh, I would actually help and guide strategy, uh, two of us work with you, uh, the average 1.48, right? The average profit is 406,000. Uh, so about, what's that, 30% or so? And the partner working in time is 1,314 hours, 31314. Now, let me just explain that. In time, we're gonna, we're gonna do an equation pretty quick. In time is everything that is non-business development related. So client chargeable time, administration, uh, management of the firm, not leadership, working in time, the average is 1314. So after year one, this is what you can expect, right? When you implement what's in the book and when you implement what I'm gonna take you through. After year one, uh, the average uh, revenue increase is 21% increase. The average is 21% increase, right? The average uh, profit increase is 98.4. So basically every piece of new revenue and some falls to the bottom line right? Because we look at expenses as well. We typically double profit in year one. And the partner working in time in year one is 20% reduction, right? Now, just to keep you engaged, I want you to put a big yes in the question box if you want that or more, right? So put a big yes in there for me, right? If you want that or more, as I sip on my coffee. Lots of yeses with exclamation marks, Ricardo. Love it. All right. Love it, love it, love it. All right. We're just going to move that over there. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, more. More would be good. Yeah, I agree with you, Joel. Right. It's not enough. <laughs> Demands of life. Here we are, all in social isolation. And <laughs> we want more, more, more. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Okay, cool. You're engaged. Awesome. We've got, uh, we had over 200 register for this, so uh, it's gonna be pretty cool. So let's look at how we're gonna do that. Let's look at what we're gonna be doing. First of all, you need to set some rules. If you've read the book, uh, you would have read early on in the chapters about uh, business by design, right? You would have read that this is your business, and you design it your way, all right? And, and, and this is the first part of implementation. Before you get into any tactics and strategies, right? You've got to set some rules. And you have to set some rules around what you want for your firm. Remember, it is your firm, no one else's. It's not your team member's firm, they'll all leave, 
They all leave all the time. At some point in time in the future, they leave. It's not your client's firm. They will uh, go as well at some point in time. It is your firm partners, right? I'm talking to the partners here. It's your signature on the mortgage. It's your signature on the credit card. It's your insurance. You're the one that gets sued. Uh, you're the one that works typically the most hours. Why don't you design it your way, right? Design it precisely the way that you want to have, have it. Now, what that means is when you answer these five questions and you answer them in detail, you need to unravel uh, and sort out what you've got going on right now. Because many of you have baggage that don't suit the answers to the five questions you are going to um, uh, answer. And the more detailed you get about the five questions and the rules underneath them, the more you'll realize that some of your existing business doesn't work in line with what you want it to be. So we're gonna start with the future, right? We're gonna start with asking yourself five key questions about what you want out of this firm, right? Question one, your ideal business life. What do you want your business professional life to look like? What do you want it to look like? So the type of clients that you personally serve, the uh, hours that you personally work, the uh, margin that you personally work out, the number of vacations you take. Um, what do you want your life to look like, your professional working life? Remember, it's your business, no one else's. This business should be fuel for your life, not a chain around your neck. I get it. The last two months with COVID-19, you've been busy. You've probably had more client communication in the last two months than you have in the last two years, right? Interesting point. Maybe you should have done that anyway, right? But you think about, is that the life you want to lead, right? Yes, we're in a pandemic. Yes, you had to swing in the gear but design it your way. Number two, your numbers. What do you want your numbers to be? So revenue, profit, number of offices, number of people, average hourly rate, work in progress numbers, accounts receivable numbers, 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 right? Your working hours, number of clients, right? You might choose to do a low client count, high volume per client, as in revenue per client. You might choose to do uh, lots of clients and low, um, you know, a revenue per client. It's up to you. You can look. After 26 years of working with thousands of accounting firms all over the world, right? I have seen some extraordinary numbers, right? Profit margins. The best I've seen for a three partner firm is 72%, right? Three partner firm, whilst the partners are only charging 20% of their time, right? I've seen a sole practitioner go to $17 million in revenue. Uh, solo, no partners, right? And then nearly half of that profit. I've seen negative work in progress, negative accounts receivable. I've seen average hourly rate for all work. I've got a client right now in Florida, accounting firm that I, that I coach, $800 an hour for bookkeeping work. Fixed monthly fee for the client at $200 a month. Bookkeeping takes 15 minutes because they've automated the whole process with technology. Numbers, numbers, numbers. You can make up whatever numbers you want. If you want to make a million dollars profit, you can. If you want to make five million, you can. If you want to make 10 million, you can. It's entirely up to you. Scratch out some numbers. Number three, these are in order. Your services. What do you want to sell and deliver? Okay, if you're in the USA right now, which many of you are, you've been doing PPP loans, right? If you're in Australia, you've been doing uh, job keeper, right? And various loans and SBA loans in the US, you've been in Europe, all these subsidies as well. Wherever you're from, you've been doing things that you probably didn't know you needed to do, but you've swung in the gear. But designing your ideal service offering. What is your ideal service offering? What do you want to sell? What do you believe is the best thing for your target market to buy? And if they don't buy it, then they may be not your target market. So you design your products and services with what you want to sell and deliver, right? I give away a lot of stuff for free. We give away books for free. Um, I give away, uh, you know, content for free. I give away, you know, strategies for free. What I sell is a coaching service, right? And a very good one 
that takes you, and I guarantee it as well, to more than a million dollars profit while working less than 500 hours. What do you want to sell, team? Is it just compliance work, bookkeeping, write-up work? Is it, well, you know what, what they really need? They really need a cash flow forecast and, um, you know, for, um, um, check-ins and quarterly meetings. You know what I really wanna sell? It's just advisory work. You decide, right? Number four, your culture. You decide what you want your team to, where they need to be, how they need to perform. They should only be A-class players. Why would you suffer mediocrity? Why would you put up, here's the test on people, right? Would you enthusiastically rehire them? There's tens of thousands of great accountants out there. Here you are, right? We're connected all over the world today from Brisbane, just down the road in the Gold Coast, Chapel Hill, I think someone said down the road, right through to Kuwait and Moscow and through Canada and the United States, all over the world right now, right? And you've probably been doing Zoom meetings the last couple of months more than you've ever done before. So, so and you've probably been doing team meetings on Zoom. Who would have thought? Well, what does that do to your business? It becomes borderless. You don't have to have the team in your office. If you had the team in your office, then shouldn't they be performing the way you want them to perform? We're going to talk about team performance today, right? You decide your culture. You decide location. Many of you have offshore teams in India or the Philippines are the two hot spots. But how do they perform? You decide, right? And number five, this is an order one through five. Your ideal client. Who is your ideal client? Exactly. Your avatar. If you had this room here, this is about 100 uh, square meters, thereabouts. The whole facility is about 200. I've only seen part of it right now. Let's call this a seminar room, right? 100 square meters. What's that? 1,000 square feet. Uh, let's say you could fit, I don't know, 30 or 40 people comfortably in this room. If you had 30 or 40 prospects in a room, ideal, A-class, perfect for you, who would they be? What industry sector? Demographics, psychographics, age, male, female, startup, not startup. Who is your absolute ideal client? Because the more defined you are on finding your ideal client, the easier this whole process is. I have this conversation at least weekly, right? Rob, want to grow a business? Great, cool, awesome. Um, who's your ideal client? Uh, not sure. Well, how are you going to grow your business? How are you going to actively grow your business if you don't know who you're targeting? You can grow your business by existing clients, of course, we're going to talk about that today, or you can grow your business by brand new clients. Now, business by design goes that way. Business life first, numbers second, services third, um, culture fourth, clients five. I'm just going to turn my webcam, webcam off because it says I may have some bandwidth issues here. Business by default goes the other way. Typically, business by default starts with uh, you start a business, right? Start an accounting firm, clients turn up, clients turn up. And then uh, we need some more people, we need some more people, right? Uh, just happens, right? Services are the clients want this, they want that. And numbers suck. And my life doesn't look so great. Think of your business by design as a clean sheet of paper. A clean sheet of paper. If you had to start again, what would it be? Who would cut the mustard? Who would cut the grade? Only A-class players. Only these services. Only these clients. And then once you design that, and by the way, I've, I've asked myself with my career, I've asked myself these five questions three times. Every time I've done it and done it properly, it takes three to four hours to map out the answers and the rules around the answers. I will only do this. I will only have this type of client, right? This is what I'm going to provide. These are the payment terms. These are the number. Rules, 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 rules. You make some decisions about what you want. We're not in business forever, right? 
surely this business should be fuel for our life and create wealth for us as well. So what do you do next, right? You design these five questions and answers and you look at your piece of paper or multiple pieces of paper and you go, you know what? A bunch of the clients I've got, don't, don't cut it. Well, what are you going to do about that? I've had a bunch of firms sell off pockets of clients that don't cut the future. What about the next prospect that turns up from a referral? Are you going to say yes to them or are you going to say no to them? Because they don't, they don't suit perfect. I, I, I said no to a um, 70,000 70, euro client this week. I said, no, this is not for you. Perfect. Demographics, psychographics. The issue was, the issue was the ambition level wasn't there. Make some decisions, then you've got to follow through. So that's some high level for you. Let's get into the weeds, right? Let's get into the detail. And we're going to start with, first of all, an equation. And the equation is called profit time index. Uh, let's see if I can get my webcam back up here again. Cool. The internet is getting bombarded at the moment all over the world. I hope it doesn't fail. Uh, profit time index. So what's this? This is a number that uh, you need to work out. And you need to work out this number. You may have already done it for, for you. Now, by the way, when you put your number into the question, I will not call you by name. It's a private number. I'm just interested to see what your number is. This is the ultimate outcome number for as you grow and develop your accounting business, right? You will have a high number. Accounting practices will have a low number, accounting businesses high number. This is, a, this is the number with all the work that you will implement with my content. Uh, maybe we do some coaching work together, maybe we don't. Um, th this is the number we drive ultimately. And it says turn that off, right? So what is it? It is the number that represents how well this business is run as a business, not a practice. So it, you take the profit before partner salaries and you divide into that all working in hours. So profit, call it 500,000, divided by um, 5,000 in hours from the three partners and we've got $100, right? So in time is going to be uh, client work, charged or not charged, we've got admin, management, HRIT, that's all in time, working in the business versus on the business. And uh, on time is business development, product development, um, we've got uh, leadership and tasks that leverage sales, right? So, so, so sales, growing and developing the business is on time, doing what the business done is does is in time. So, you work out this number as a starting mark because with all the things that you do, the objective here is that we have a high profitability and low partner contribution. High pro thank you, Colin. Uh, high profitability, low partner contribution. What's yours? What is your number? Quickly work that out while I have a sip of my coffee and then I'll give you some answers and then we'll get into the details. We start there. Work out what yours is approximately. And I'll give you a sliding scale and then we'll get into the detail. Just pop it into the uh, question when you've worked it out. Just approximate's fine. I measure this every single month with my coaching clients because uh, we're looking to grow this number uh, every month. So we put a strategy in place. You see, if you're running a practice, typically that means your practitioner's practicing. That means that you are uh, doing what the business does effectively. And this number will be a little bit lower. If you're running a business and it's your choice that has leverage and that will ultimately work without you, keep popping the numbers in, got a few coming through now, which is nice, thank you. If you've got a business that runs, then this number will be higher because we've got leverage, we've got structure, we've got great profitability, we've got lowish partner contribution. And by the way, the highest I've had so far that a firm I've coached is six and a half thousand, uh, literally. Um, and she's a case study in the in the book. And uh, Mackie runs. Uh, she works about 100 hours a year, uh, total working time. And 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 the PTI is is, is six and a half thousand. 
So whatever your number number is, here is the sliding scale. Not to 250, you're basically overworked and underpaid. Not to 250, overworked and underpaid. 250 to 500, you've started to make a little bit of money, but you're still working too much as the partner, right? 500 to 1,000, you might be making some money, but what about the time? It gets interesting here at four and five. 1,000, 1,500, leverage is kicked in going great. 1,500, 2,500, now we're talking, but don't get too comfortable. Now, around four and five, you're starting to make around about a million uh, dollars or euros uh, per year, right? Around four and five. And often complacency kicks in, as in, oh, this is awesome, life's good, got a new boat, got a new car, paid off the debt, got some charitable things going on, life is grand, I'm having a good time, right? This is the time when you don't take your foot off the accelerator. This is the time, friends, when you put the foot down. So from here, Let's double it from here without doubling the time. We're running a business here, non accounting practice. Team, it's time to stop practicing. You've been at it long enough. We've got a business to run here, an accounting business. We get into the red zone, five to seven and a half thousand. Keep pushing it. There's more in you yet. And you get up around this black area, seven and a half thousand to 10,000. Corporate structures kicked in, and you either go big or go home. Take your pick. Our objective is to move you through. So what I'm going to take you through are a bunch of strategies today, and I've picked eight to go in detail with you, right? Over the next hour, is, we're finishing uh, half past the next hour uh, maximum. And eight strategies out of 32 to go into. So I call this the Profit Time Program, with the objective being meaning, freedom, and lifestyle. Right, that's our objective. Your meaning, your freedom, your lifestyle. We measure along the way, average hourly rate, efficiency, number of clients, average fee per client. We also measure revenue, profit cash, and of course, profit time index. These are the indices, the metrics that we measure. And depending on your speed of implementation and your effectiveness will determine how quickly you get your meaning, your freedom, your lifestyle, your business by design, depending on how fast you implement and how well you implement. You end up going through four stages, right? We fix what's going on today. We minimize time dramatically. We scale the business to the size that you want and need, and we lead the business along the way. Fix, minimize, scale, lead. Fix, minimize, scale, lead. You'll notice in the book that, in the Wealthy Accountant book, there's a lot of detail about this as well, right? But today, I want to uh, do, do this live with you uh, so that you can get ask some questions if you want to uh, and get some more detail that's not in the book, right? So under fix, there are eight key things under fix. Uh, number one is price up front and price increase. Uh, I'm going to come back to that one in a tick. Number two, value pricing. Come back to that one as well. Number three. Recurring revenue packaging. Getting all of your clients um, for the known work and known entities on a monthly fixed fee, recurring revenue. It's a sweet thing. Where every month, you know, if you do 1.2 million, 100 a month is coming in. Every single month. Da -ding, da -ding, da -ding, da -ding, da -ding. And you can do that with the known, even if it's $200 a month. A $2,500 client. The known work, the known entities, you throw in uncapped, unmeted phone calls, emails, and meetings, and you build a subscription business. A subscription business has much higher value than a project business. Managing scope creep and scope seep. Managing the uh, work that you're supposed to be doing vis-a-vis -vis extra things in there. You know, I, as a classic example, right? Yesterday, I received an email from the lawnmower store. Right, the sun is coming up. I've got about an acre and a half here. I have a ride on lawnmower. It goes in for a general service. And of course, they send me the work in progress because, Rob, this is not a general service. There's some other things that need fixing. Is that okay with you? Are you managing the scope creep, the scope seep? Uh, lock up production. So work in progress accounts receivable. You should have negative work in progress and very minimal accounts receivable. 
The only time when you go to a recurring revenue model, the only time you'll have accounts receivable is if there's a special project on top of that, if the uh, ACH, the direct debit or the credit card is not working, that's the only time. So consequently, it should be fixed and wiped out. Client mix takes a while, but I believe you should only have A-class clients. Only A-class clients. Why would you put up with anyone else? Well, why would you put up with clients that you loathe? Why would you put up with rude clients? Uh, client service program. What is your customer service program? You know, in uh, July, um, I do a series for the firms I coach called In the Clubhouse With, right? So this being the clubhouse, camera's not on right now, but you saw it briefly before, in the clubhouse with experts. So uh, uh, tomorrow I'm doing an expert, this is only for private, private firms we coach, uh, in the clubhouse with Michael Griffiths, who is the world authority on referrals, right? In, what's that, May and June, I'm in the clubhouse with Simon Bowen. Simon is gonna teach how to sell by Zoom, right? Pretty cool. In July, I've got Amanda Stevens, who is a world authority on customer experience, customer service, right? And so we do this in the clubhouse with interview things. What's your client experience program? What's your documented process for client experience? Communication process. What is going to be your structured cadence of meetings with your clients? Not ad hoc reactive, none of that, right? But what, what about the, 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 the volume of times you'll proactively call them, the volume of times you uh, actively meet with them. What's your cadence of meetings? Fixing day-to-day -day operations, minimizing, minimizing time. We're going to go into, I've picked two out of each one of these, but I'm just doing an overview right now. And then we'll go into two of each one uh, with some detail, have some questions around the two. Well, we don't have time to do all 32. It will take about three days. So we're just picking some highlights for you. Minimizing time. We've got a fixed fee with the client. Let's minimize the time. Workflow management. What's your manufacturing process? What's your process for getting things in and out? What is your uh, uh, method methodology of speed for creating the product? Think of your product creation like manufacturing a product. Client excellence coordinators. Administrative team members who are doing the work that the accountants used to do. Chasing up information from clients, you know, processing work, et cetera, et cetera. Time budgets on all jobs. I'll come back to that one as one of my highlights, right? Uh, technology for the firm. How well is your, how good is your tech? Some of you have been stretched, right? This last couple of months, you've been stretched on tech. You haven't had web cameras. You haven't had microphones. You haven't had suitable technology at home. You haven't had cloud computing, right? Some of you, some of you have been sorted because you've had to go home. The team have had to go home in most locations around the world. What about your clients? You know, is the client on a, on a reliable cloud ac accounting platform so that it seamlessly integrates with your platform? Uh, systems and processes. What are your documented processes for how we do it here? Uh, learning development. What's your L&D plan? What's your process for um, teaching? teaching your team members uh, how, how they do new things. So for example, we, when, I, when I coach a firm, we, uh, we work with the leadership for sure. We just started working with the team members as well to teach them skills. You know, over Zoom, pretty cool. What's yours? And then partner time, lastly, what I like to call the 30-60-10 rule, 30% of partner time in a uh, high-end client delivery. We've got 60% uh, in a sales capacity and 10% in leadership. 30, 60, 10, minimize, right? Minimizing time dramatically. Scaling, I'm gonna pick two from that, right? Scaling the business. When you've got a business that works, that has got fast throughput, high profitability, right? We've got um, a seamless operation, so to speak. We can just pile on the revenue. And when we pile on the revenue, most of the new revenue becomes profit. Because in the minimized section, we create capacity to grow whatever size we want. That's pretty cool. Well, why on earth would you merge with another firm if your current firm doesn't work so well in the first place? Why would you go and acquire another firm if the current one you've got is not humming along? You're just adding more of the same. 
Wouldn't it make sense, team, to fix what we've got today to minimize time and then we can grow it, right? Grow it organically, brand development. What does your brand stand for? Client goals document, I'll come back to that one. Uh, find opportunities, I'm coming back to that one as well. Uh, niche markets, who exactly are you going after? I work with accounting firms all over the world, right? I will speak at conferences, but when it comes to my coaching, right, the direct input from me on your strategy implementation and my sidekick, Wendy, when it comes to that, I know exactly who it is. It's about a million dollars to five million in revenue. It's about one to three partners, sometimes four, and more than a hundred business clients. And if I've got a client in front of me like that, that is also ambitious, then we can do some business and I can help them the most, the fastest. Who is your niche market? Exactly who they are, right? Lead, and once you know who they are, lead generation for new clients is a snap. Because the, the leads come in as A-class leads. Productization of services. If you do it once, create a system for it. Sales process, sales skills. What's your process for creating new business? And with the team, do we onshore, offshore, or outsource, or all live up? Here you are experiencing Zoom, right? For many of you, the last two months, the first time with your team, the team can be anywhere. They can work remote. When we all go back to, when you go back to your office environment, because my office environment is my clubhouse here, when you go back to your office environment, you might go, you know what? That wasn't so bad, that sort of worked. Maybe we should do more of that. Maybe we only need half the office space. Lead, leading your business. What's your vision, mission, BHAG, and what are your values? Big, hairy, audacious goal, as Jim Collins coined the phrase. What's your vision, what's your mission? What are your company values? What's your organizational structure? What's your operational plan look like? Reporting and accountability, who reports to whom? How do you create accountability? Team culture, team performance, we deal with team performance uh, this morning or this afternoon or this evening, wherever you are. Uh, themes and celebrations and meeting rhythms. We look at this and we realize there's a lot to do. I get it, there's a lot to do, team. I understand there's a lot to do. In the next few weeks, you'll be able to go to my website and do a an online test, but nearly finished it off, uh, where you can score out of 10 and it's going to give you an automated report on exactly what you need to do for your firm. Stay, stay tuned for that one. That's coming out in a few weeks' time. To give you an idea, right, The out of 400, because I have 40 questions, right, all related to these, you honestly score out of 10 on these. Most firms are halfway on the lot. Some are less, and that's okay. Realization of where you're at is the first piece, right? We've got our profit time index, our number, our output number, which is driven by the implementation of all of this. And then we've got all these strategies to implement along the way. Some of these strategies can take 12 months to implement, like workflow management, top left. Workflow management is never done, right? Others, like recurring revenue packaging, takes two to three hours per client once only. If you've got a client on a uh, in arrears time-based billing system or project, to move them to a fixed fee monthly, it's about two to three hours per client. Client conversation, administrative uh, process, you know, getting them signed up on the bank, credit card, ACH direct debit, whatever it is, about two to three hours. Once, that's only once, but it takes a while. Others never end. Lead generation never ends. Leading your business never ends. Some of these are once off, some of them are ongoing. So let's have a look at um, digging into two in each um, chunk and have some questions around that, right? So first of all, price up front uh, and price increase and value pricing. Let's deal with those two because that's going to drive some immediate profit. The outcome number here is average hourly rate. So you do a million dollars in revenue, you did 5,000 client delivery hours, therefore $200, right? So that's our metric with the output on these two. So our, our, our objective is to drive the margin, driving the margin of average hourly rate. 
And based on your value belief and your value contribution, based on that, and six sequential steps will determine how fast and high your average hourly rate goes. We've got three steps below, three above the waterline. When you're below the waterline, you're drowning in average hourly rate regression, right? Above the waterline, you are thriving in average hourly rate progression. So let's have a look at what's below the waterline. If you price in arrears and you are average hourly rate aware, then simply having a price increase by the hour will drive it up. You should do that, right, if that's where you are. Step two, we still price in arrears. We now may have an average hourly rate target. And you introduce some new services after you've had a price increase to justify a said target. Think of it this way. If you do 10,000 client delivery hours and you charge by the hour still, I hope you don't, but some of you do. If you do 10,000 client delivery hours and you put your charge rates up by $20, that's $200,000 of extra profit, provided you don't write it off. You should do that. Number three, starting to peak above a little bit, right? We do some price up front and we get some write-ups. We do some price up front, some write-ups. Now it gets interesting. 100% price up front. Every project is priced before starting. We drive time down. We talk about time down and when we get to our minimized section, we get more efficient with what we're doing. But we still hold on to charge rates. If you still hold on to charge rates, hourly rates at this point in time in number four, then you're mentally priced by the hour, the way you used to do it back at point one. So once you get over the hurdle where the client knows the price before starting, then we can actually get rid of the hourly rates, but keep the timesheets. Too many firms, and by the way, if I had my time over again, in book number one, let me just put my webcam on here. In book number one, Accounting practices don't add up. I said in there, get rid of the charge rates. I, I'll get rid of the timesheets. I was wrong. I apologize if you read that. I can't go back in time. I've seen too many firms get rid of timesheets too early. Yeah, I know it's a nice thing to do, but a lot of your metrics go out the window. Let's get rid of the charge rates but keep the time sheets and have a time budget on every job and drive the time down. We drive the time down, we get more capacity, we get higher average hourly rate, and we start thinking in value pricing. Pricing based on value, not based on time. And lastly, number six. Lastly, number six is moving everyone to MRR, monthly recurring revenue. You move everyone to MRR, right? And after a while, when the average hourly rate becomes so obscene, you don't worry about it anymore. Because the client's paying a thousand a month, two, three, four, five thousand a month, whatever it is, right? You've bundled in phone calls, emails, and meetings, and some months there's no work to do. Some months there's a lot of work to do. But you do the wash up at the end of the year and say, wow. Average hourly rate for this client was $650. Average hourly rate for this client was $1250. Average hourly rate was $400. That's pretty good. Like my firm, Peter, $800 bucks an hour for bookkeeping. Fixed monthly fee, drive the time down, technology used. We go through these six steps. We jump to number four as fast as we can, right? We jump to number four as fast as we can. Then we start tweaking with the system. Never, ever, ever have a dollar's budget on a job. You've got $5,000 worth of time to do this job. No worries, boss. I'll stop, I'll start, I'll, I'll pat it out, I'll go slow, I'll go fast. Miraculously, it's $5,000. How do they do that? So think of it this way, right? If we look at this number of average hourly rate, little spreadsheet here, couldn't resist doing a spreadsheet, right? Let's say your target is $5 million in revenue and you've got $250 average hourly rate, you need 20,000 client delivery hours to do that. Simple maths, right? But if you have a 
target average hourly rate of 500 bucks, then we only need 10,000 client delivery hours. So if we've got a higher target, we need less humans, less office space, less expenses, everything, we make more profit. Average hourly rate for client delivery work drives the entire profit model other than expenses for the business. We drive it north. So one is with some tactics and strategies like price upfront, efficiency, monthly recurring revenue, right? Getting rid of the charge rates, keeping the timesheets. And the second piece to drive this number north is value pricing, where we actually price based on our contribution to the client's condition, not on how much time it took, or alternatively, you know, what they've paid in the past. We price with a different metric. And there are three components to value pricing, right? There's your personal value belief. Do you believe in you? The first sale, friends, is to yourself. The first sale is to yourself. Number two is value contribution. Is there a measurable contribution to the client's condition? And the client's condition could be peace of mind. Could be to sleep well at night. That could be the client's condition. The client's condition could be a tax refund. Could be a cash flow improvement, an expense reduction. What's the measurable client contribution, the value contribution? And then lastly, is the value perception to the client. How well have you articulated your value? So we get all three humming, right? Let's have a look at these three. Value belief, value contribution, and value perception. If you've got high value belief, right? You're full of yourself, very confident. And you've got high value contribution, client gets an amazing result. But you haven't articulated it, value perception before you do it, then you won't hit your mark. If you've got a high value contribution, as in the client gets an amazing result, and you've articulated it super, super well, but you're a gutless wonder, you won't hit your mark. And here's the worst one. You've got high value belief, you articulate the blazes out of it, but the client doesn't get a great result, you won't hit your mark. Uh, Beavis, great question. Keep, questions, keep, keep them coming through. So question from Beavis. Uh, why have you changed your mind on timesheets? Why should accountants still use them? Good question, I was waiting for something like that. So, first of all, there was a big movement about 20 years ago, ditch the timesheets, ditch the timesheets by a number of people around the world. In 2011, I said the same thing in a book number one, right? As we then monitor the performance of the firm with those that have, right? The reality is most firms have ditched timesheets way too early, right? You can ditch them in the future for sure, right? But in the, in the, in the stages of growing and developing the firm, you need to measure what's important, right? How do you measure time under budget, tub, right? On how efficient you are when you've got no timesheet. How do you do that? How do you actually measure that, you know, our throughput turnaround time? You can do it manually. You know, raw materials came in on Monday and it went out three weeks later. But we need technology to help us with this. We keep the time sheets for measurement and manage. What you can measure, you can manage. What you can measure and manage, you can control. And the output of this is you will find, just trust me on this one, we keep the time sheets, we get rid of the charge rates when we're priced up front. We're, the objective with fixing, fixing up day for sure, is driving average hourly rate, which is profitability through the roof. Questions, observations, keep them coming through. Here to answer any question of yours, whatever you want. All right, there's a couple in fix. Let's have a look at minimize. We're gonna look at time budgets on jobs and systems and processes. So if we've fixed the price, our objective now is minimize the time. 
let's minimize the time dramatically. Now, in 1958, this guy called Cyril Northcote Parkinson, in 1958, wrote a book called Parkinson's Law. And you may remember this from university days. And the basic law is, and was and still is today, work expands so as to fill the available time, fill the time available for its completion, which means people fill the available time with what work they've got to do. And my take on this, as I think about Parkinson's law in today's terms, is that uh, my update, resources are consumed at the rate of resources are available. Resources are consumed at the rate resources are available. Think of this, right? Uh, let's use a personal example and then we'll get into a business example. Uh, I am a three to four minute shower guy. I had one today, right? Three to four minute showers. Uh, some of you are longer. Uh, the resource is the shower, the water, right? The time under the shower. Uh, a little while ago, I was on a flight uh, down to Melbourne from Brisbane, early morning flight, and I got up and sure enough, it was a, it was a Sunday night, so Monday morning was the shower, Sunday night I realised, ah, oh, damn it, the gas bottles are empty. Uh, so we live in the countryside and we rely on gas, like bottled gas, to power our hot water. No gas, Sunday night, store's not open. Oh dear, what are we going to do? So I knew I was in for a cold one, right? I was in for a coldie on Monday morning. My resource is now depleted of hot water. How quick was that shower, right? I timed it under 30 seconds and I got the job done, right? You see, the real time is 30 seconds if you think about it. But if I've got the resource available, I'll take a little bit longer. It's human nature. It's human nature to pad out the time, right? Lace stuff fit. It's okay. We'll just keep going, right? You give me five thousand dollars worth of time, I'll take five thousand. There you go, boss. You give me two thousand, I'll take two thousand. Oh man, the client's coming in Thursday at three o'clock. I better get the job done. You look at office space, and it's a resource. You go, oh, I've got space there. Uh, maybe we can put four people. Let's hire four people, right? You might be better to put a pool table in or a ping pong table. Resources are consumed at the rate resources are available. Think of it this way, right? Let's talk about house building, to build a house. Let me tell you about my friend Michael, and I put this story in the book if you haven't read it already. Uh, my friend Michael was coaching 24 of the leadership team of Australia's, at the time, second largest home builder. Their time to build a house was 120 days, 120 days to build the house. Michael says to them, team, how do we do it in 10? How do we build the house in 10? And of course the leadership team have said, you gotta be crazy, what have you been smoking, man? We're the second biggest in the land. Uh, 10, you gotta be, no, no, how do we do it in 10? And then he said to them, right, the following phrase, I know it can't be done, but if it could be done, what do we need to fix, alter, redo, different system, different process, different whatever? Hypothetically, what could we do to make it close to 10? So they brainstorm for two hours. They brainstorm for two hours in the hypothetical world, ideal world, clean sheet of paper, what would need to change to build the house in 10 days. Two hours later, the executives are exhausted with ideas and Michael simply says, well, just go and do that. And they did, right? And they didn't hit 10 days, but they did hit 42. You imagine a home builder. Some of you have home builders as clients. To go from 120 days to 42 days, work in progress, what did that do to their cash flow? Through the roof. What did that do to their customer experience? Through the roof. What did that do to referrals? Through the roof. Because they changed their mindset about what was possible. The script is as follows. I know it can't be done, but hypothetically, if it could be done, what would I need or you need to fix, alter, redo, different system, different process, different whatever, to make it close to being done? You see, we want to reduce the time on the job. That's the objective, right? So to reduce the time on the job, 
if you want to reduce time dramatically, right, dramatically, then we need to step back and say, okay, this job was 30 hours last year. That Nixon, 30 hours. Team, little workshop. You know, Nixon, uh, he uh, a bit disorganized. His technology's not great. He's got, um, never sends all the information on time. And, you know, we're sort of backwards and forwards with him all the time. It takes 30 hours. So team, how do we do his job in five? And I know it can't be done, but hypothetically, if it could be done, what we need to fix, alter, redo, do something different, different system, different whatever, to make it close to being done. So we brainstorm the answers. And let me assure you, team, your answers will be one or all of five of these. Number one, we gather all the information before starting. The objective here is time under budget. Self-imposed deadlines, communicate to the team and clients. You know, one of the firms I coached in Maryland, um, one of the first things we did was time under budget. They measured it at two, hour, two hours and 15 minutes per client per month. Palmulus is the firm. Great guys, right? Two hours and 15 was the average per client per month. Within 90 days, by doing exactly what we're talking about here, they got up to one hour 45. 45 minute improvement per client per month. With that little hack, they freed up capacity, then we piled on some new revenue, they grew the revenue by $1.3 million, 1.2 million of it was profit. And they let go one person because they had the capacity by doing exactly what we're talking about here. One job at a time, uninterrupted time. We've got one thing to do. We've got a deadline, right? I've got all the info, leave me alone. Productization and systemization of everything. And the technology for the client and the firm. These will be the five categories that your team come up with. So I encourage you, just go and do that. Time under budget, measuring tub as a percentage. So we had an hour's budget of five hours. We got four, 80%, right? Tub was 80%. We've got 20% off. That's our objective here, team. For speed, that equals value. For throughput, work in progress, gets capacity, gets average value and improvement, grow your business without growing the overhead. Now, let's talk about accountants. What do they do all day? What do accountants actually do all day? I'm gonna suggest they spend most of their day checking and processing data. Checking and processing data. Raw materials comes in, we check it, we check it, we check it, we check it. We put it into the chart of accounts. We have a look at our accounting software. We check it, debits and credits, check it, check it, check it, check it, check it. We process it at the end, right? Checking and processing dead data. The data that, for compliance work, the data they are checking is old, right? It's incomplete typically because not everything was there. We're backwards and forwards for the client. Why? Why do accountants check and process most of their day? There are three reasons why. Number one, at the client side, they are a little bit disorganized. Their systems aren't great. They have systems that uh, uh, archaic, paper-based, hard drive accounting, not cloud, um, at the client side. So when it comes to you, it's like they might as well have done nothing. Their bookkeeping's not up to date, it's unreconciled, it's incorrect, you might as well have just done it yourself. Number two, systems and processes. Your systems at your side aren't great either. Insofar as you've got paper, you've got um, accounting software or practice management software that doesn't, in some cases, seamlessly integrate with the clients, your systems. And the third part in the chain of data going through at the government side, their systems aren't great either. Now you can't change number three, right? We're gonna wait for that one to change. In New Zealand, a couple of people from Dunedin I see, in New Zealand, you know, you can click a button in your um, accounting software and file directly with the 
uh, government agencies. Bypass the accountant altogether. Wow, there you go. Let's have a look at one and two. It is all about inefficient systems. So wouldn't it be neat to have one way to do it? One way, right? We only have clients that have a cloud accounting platform and you've only got one of two choices or three choices, or maybe one choice, right? Up to you. We only do the work this one way. This is the documented process for doing it. We're looking for the most efficient, fast process for doing the work. Slow people need not apply for this job. We all do fast things. You've got team members that do great things. Let's copy the ones with speed. The objective with minimize is to minimize time dramatically. Think of the military. Some of you have been in the military, right? There's only one way to do everything. There's no variation of the one way. You want speed, you want time under budget, you want to minimize time, find your one way. Find your one way and do it that way. And your clients will love you for it. You will have a much better run accounting firm. Minimize time. Let's have a look at scale. And the two areas on scale will be client goals documented and find opportunities. Uh, I decided to pick these two because I can teach today enough details so you can get busy on them. Uh, if we start getting into the other ones, we are big, big, big topics on leads and sales, products, etc. So I picked two that I can put in the time that you get some value from. So let's have a look at, first of all, uh, client goals. What's the ultimate purpose of your client relationship? The ultimate purpose of your client relationship is what? I believe, I believe that the ultimate purpose of your client relationship is as follows, that all clients buy every service they need that helps them achieve their goals. All clients buy every service that they need that helps them achieve their goals. That to me is the role of the trusted advisor. That to me says, as the tr which you've got status of, the trusted advisor, that to me says you're doing your job correctly. You are understanding this client implicitly. You are working with them to see where they're at now. You're asking them where do they want to go and you're providing appropriate services to help them get there. That is your objective for the accounting business, right? The accounting practice just does what they have to do reactively. This is a proactive process. So how do we do this? We do what's called a gap meeting. And the gap meeting stands for goal achievement process. I'm gonna step you through the meeting. And then if you want the template, you've got to put um, something in the question box. I'll get the template to you. So this is a meeting to determine what the goals are. Then you go away and then you match the services to the goals, right? It starts with the background of the situation, background of the client in detail. We map the goal, we ask them where they wanna go. We understand the issues now, we talk about value contribution, we talk about consequences and timing, right? So let me send you, oh, Michelle, you beat me to it. I haven't even given you the detail, what you've got to post in here, right? Just wait, 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 right? Some of you have jumped the gun, Rakesh, Michelle and Campbell, it's okay, right? So here is the actual process. A uh, little bit detailed. And so we start with, uh, so I'm going to, this is going to be cover your whole screen and then uh, I'll show you the, a clean version of this. I open up the meeting with, well, this meeting, by the way, is an hour to an hour and a half per client, right? Welcome, understand the background, ask questions around background. Goals, where do you want to go? And these ones here, issues, uh, what's going on, values, some questions around that, consequences, then we've got timing, and then we've got follow-up. Now, uh, make some notes. This is a one-pager, do it on your iPad, right? write notes. Here is the template in a much cleaner version of this, right? Now, if this template, after years of observing client meetings, this template is gangbusters, right? 
as far as in the flow, one, two, three, four to eight. That's the flow of the meeting. You do this with all of your existing clients. If you want a copy of this, just put in, make it simple, nothing big sentences here. Just write yes in the chat, right? And I'll email you because we've got all your email details when you're registered. Um, put in the chat and we'll get it to you. You can read it later on, right? Haha, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so Frank is haha, a yes, right? Just put yes. <laughs> all the yes is coming through. Uh, if you don't want it, that's fine. By the way, team, sneaky by the way, this was in the book and you had to email me. There's a few little hidden gems in the book to, to show me that you read the book. Uh, there's actually three points where when you read the book and it says, if you want this, email Rob at my address and I'll email it to you. I know you haven't read the book because you haven't emailed me. I only received about 20 out of thousands, right? So I request you're still reading it. Very good, right? I, Ricardo, you're off the hook. You only started the book last week. I got it, right? So I put little tests in there to see if you read it. Now, I will send it to you. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. I emailed you this morning. Thank you, Joel. I haven't read my emails yet today. Good on you. I will look at that uh, later on. Uh, Joel, since you've emailed me, I'll send you a couple of little bonuses as well. All right, so... Um, uh, just put yes in there. I'll get that to you separately. I'll get one of my team to send it to you. Now, so that's step one. <laughs> Very good. Reading it as well. Cool, cool, cool. Hope you enjoyed it. Step two, opportunities and compliance. We've got 22 minutes to go, team. Uh, got all the yeses in there. So is there opportunities in compliance? Here's the thing, team. I have a 100% success rate of... Uh, teaching accountants how to find opportunities in compliance. Uh, Johnny Bostrom, we did this in Sweden at your office, your old office, if you recall, right? I remember that. This is about three years ago when I attended. It's called Find Opportunities. And uh, Johnny, I hope, I know you're in your firm these days, I hope you took that workshop we did. You remember, good man, right? Uh, and I, I can't remember the detail, Johnny, but uh, let me help, help me out with the chat. I think we had 12 people in the office in Stockholm and we found, I'm going to say 40 or 50 projects, Johnny. Just plug in there. How many have we got? I can't remember. Uh, but it was something like that. Typically, we find three to five projects per, per person. Um, so here's, the, here's what we do, right? So in a small team of people, so something like that. Yeah, thanks, Johnny. Um, in a small team, three or four people in your office, you uh, get a piece of work in progress, so a current piece of work, and the person who owns the client, knows the client, explains the situation. This is a 15 minute workshop per client per year, add the time to the job, right? So small team, three or four, one person knows the client, explains to the team, uh, this is what the client's all about. Uh, and then says to the team, what our objective here is to find, is there something else we can help this client with, right? Here's some tips. What you're looking for is maybe sales or break-even analysis. So you're looking for, in the data, you're looking for hidden opportunities that you can go back to the client with. I've had as many as 15 projects for a client. I've done this over 3,000 times. Uh, sorry, I've done this with over 3,000 accountants. Uh, Johnny and the team from Stockholm, we had about 12 in the room at the time. Maybe it's benchmarking. Maybe it's a gross profit analysis. Any trends you can pick up that could be a hidden opportunity for you to help the client with. Maybe market analysis and expenses. Maybe you can analyze the number of clients and maybe there's, an, there's something as an opportunity there. Maybe it's the frequency of purchase per client. You could work that out and say, you know what? If we did this, they could get that. Maybe it's the average spend per client. Insurance spend. Maybe it's cash flow, tax interest payments, overdraft, line of credit, bank interest. Uh, receivables, debtors, payable days, or something else. If you start thinking about the data in front of you and spend the time, you will come up with some fresh ideas that you can take the client back. Now, what you do with this is you hard code this into your workflow system. And you hard code it in an end of job checklist. And the end of job checklist has a question that says, so what ideas do you have to help this client? So that's the starting prefix to help this client improve revenue. 
What ideas do you have to help this client improve profit? What ideas do you have to help this client improve cash flow? What ideas do you have to help this client with asset protection, tax minimization, succession or sale if appropriate, financial retirement, and estate planning? What ideas do you have, team, around these eight areas? Not all apply, but spend 15 minutes per job at the end of the job and brainstorm additional opportunities that whoever has the client relationship, the partner typically, goes back to the client and says, you know, whilst we're doing your compliance work for the year, we discovered some ideas that you might want to think about to help you improve your cash flow. Oh, what did you come up with? Well, we worked out that your interest right now is too high and we can help you refinance. We can help you. Sure, Michelle, we'll send you the book if you haven't got it yet. Um, uh, or you can just go to robnixon.com, Michelle, and uh, download it straight away. It'll be quicker that way, actually, uh, by the time we get through all the, all the requests yet. So hard code this into the system. What ideas do you have? Come up with ideas. Go back to the client with those ideas. And you'll be amazed. When you do this, so far, when I've trained accountants to do this, we've had a 100% success rate of finding opportunities in every single client. You're going with that mindset, 100% success rate. And you sniff out what else can we do for this client. We get to know the client much better through the data. We get to know the client better through the data. We have a relationship with the client and they buy something else that helps them achieve their goals. Got it? Give me a got it, yes, or something in there. So you're listening. Um, if this is all making sense, all making sense. Love it, love it, love it. Give me a high five or some sort of reaction. Got it. Thank you, Kaylin. Gotcha, gotcha. Yep, awesome. You're welcome, Sherry. All right, or Sheree, however you pronounce it. Great. We've got little smiley faces, emojis. Uh, making sense. Cool. All righty. Let's move on. And let's uh, move to our final piece of leadership. And I want to talk about organizational structure and team performance. So, we are building uh, an accounting business here. We're building an accounting business, not an accounting practice. And the accounting business has structure to it, right? And the structure looks like this. This is the organizational chart and the accountability chart of an accounting business, right? Now, in small firms, there's lots of roles. In large firms, there's lots of roles. The roles need to be done, but in larger firms, you've got people who might just wear the one hat. So let's have a look at the roles, the focus of the role, and the metrics of each role. So first of all, let's look at the top here. We've got a CEO and business manager, separate people. Someone's running the day-to-day, -day, execution of strategy, business manager. Someone's in charge of vision and strategy, CEO. Externally, you have a coach like me, for example, to help you with the detail, to keep you accountable, and to, to drive you forward, right? Uh, someone like me. Uh, and, but internally, we've got a driver and we've got an executioner in the best possible term, not executioner for killing, but ex ex executing strategy. Below here, we have three divisions. We've got our revenue division, our fulfillment division, and our support division. Revenue, of course, is new revenue. Fulfillment is doing what we've sold and uh, support is uh, infrastructure. So let's have a look at revenue first. We have our revenue manager, marketing manager, marketing coordinator, client relationship managers, and sales coordinators. Now, a couple of people can play the same role. For example, your uh, receptionist may play the role of sales coordinator. Uh, the partner who might be doing some client work will play the role of client relationship manager. The marketing coordinator could be outsourced to an agency. The marketing manager might be in sort of, I have a part-time marketing manager, uh, Michelle. The revenue manager might be the CEO, right? But someone's got to do all these tasks, right? How are you going to grow a business if we're not driving the revenue? Who is driving the revenue? The focus of this is business development, innovation of product, brand management, uh, lead generation, all clients buy everything they need. That's a sales role, uh, new A-class clients, and of course, retention rate, right? That's the focus of the BD team. The metrics, in each one of these divisions, there are five 
there are five divisions, right? Sorry, five divisions. In each one of these divisions, there are five metrics. In this case, the metrics are number of quality leads, sales meetings, revenue, average hourly rate on new sales, and average fee per client. Five metrics that you can report on weekly and monthly. Let's have a look at uh, fulfillment. So fulfillment is the, we'll get the fulfillment manager. Uh, you might call a workflow manager. We've got uh, managers and accountants. We've got consultants and coaches, planners and brokers, and our client excellence coordinators, which are in charge of the administrative side of the doing of the sold work, right? So the objective here is efficiency of work. That's the objective. Uh, the doing of the sold services, creating capacity, we've got uh, workflow management, turnaround time, lodgements and filing and QA. The five metrics that you measure for this team, turnaround time, filing on time, uh, find opportunities, time under budget, we spoke about that before, and then average hourly rate. So we're measuring weekly and monthly for the fulfillment team as well. Some of these are a weekly measure, some of them are a monthly measure. And then we look at the support team. Support team, here's our logistics, office manager, We've got a financial controller, HR manager, business host, receptionist, and executive assistants in here. And their focus is going to be technology, HR and legal, uh, premises, admin, uh, systems and processes, finance reporting, right? Internal activities. Their metrics, uh, billing, work in progress, accounts receivable, accounts payable, and time to reporting. Now, I didn't put a yes in here, but I will send you, if you type yes in, um, an editable version of this for your, so it's a PDF editable version PDF. Just pop yes in, I'll get it sent to you, right? I will get it sent to you. Uh, because as we grow the business, we need to grow the structure. And this structure of these three divisions here no matter whether you're a three-person firm or a 300-person firm, the roles exist. We must have some structure. I'll make sure I get that to you. Just put yes in there. Uh, I know the sequence of the yeses, so I know what I'm sending each uh, person. Uh, Non-accounting company, Brett. That's interesting. Yeah, you could use it, I presume, right? It's targeting to accountants, uh, specifically all child for accountants. Okay, we're talking about people here. People in the right roles in the right seats. Let's talk about people performance, right? Team performance. And if you look at team performance, there's five aspects of team performance. Because no matter where they are, the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we have the right people? Do we have the right people? As I said before, why would you suffer mediocrity? Do we have the right people? The, the, the litmus test would you enthusiastically rehire them? Would you enthusiastically rehire the team you've got? If there's a, mm, not too sure about that one, well, free up their future. Coach them first. Are they motivated? Are they engaged? Are they willingly coming up with suggestions and ideas? Are they enthusiastic about change? You, you don't want any people on your bus with their hand on the handbrake of the bus. We only want people who are willing to put the bus in fifth gear and go for it. Why would you suffer anyone else? Do they know how to do what you do? Do they know what to do? And do we have the right environment? Are you providing the right environment for your team? The right technology, the right office space, you know, the right air, the right windows, you know, colors, facilities, you, you put the test over these five because our objective here is to get high-performing teams, right? That's our objective. High-performing teams have some traits. So we run this test over and we work out what we need to do differently. Common purpose. We're all heading in the one direction towards that lighthouse. And values and standards. We have standards of performance and we have values, operating values. Goal alignment. We're all aligned with the direction. There's no, you know what? I don't know whether we should shoot for that. That just seems a bit ambitious. Can, can we just do this? No. 
Remember, it's your business, not your team's business. Roles, responsibilities, and priorities. Structure. This is where structure comes in discussion before. Open communication, open book management. The team know the numbers. They know what's going on. There's no secrecy here, unless it's private, of course. Participation and support. Everyone's supporting each other, participating. You have a power plan of action, a rolling action plan that you knock off projects every week. Powerful systems implementation. Risk taking and innovation. And you celebrate as well. You celebrate. You celebrate quarterly with themes. You celebrate every time you get a success by ringing the bell. You high five, there's energy. High performing teams team has energy. How's the energy in your place? You want, you're on this webinar for a reason, right? You want to learn some new things, maybe you revisit a couple of old things, but it'll get maybe a, an energy injection. I'm not too sure why you attended, right? But for whatever reason it is, uh, we want, effectively, you want to run a better business. So if you want to run a better business, you personally must first become a better business person. You want to run a better business. You need to be a better business person. You want to run a better business. You've got to design it your way so that your team perform. I encourage you to man in the mirror. Exactly, Brett. Yeah, there you go. Great song, right? Great song. Look at you first. You bet. Uh, in the back of the book, by the way, the last chapter is all about, um, the last chapter in the book is all about getting things done uh, you personally, a bit of personal development in there. I even talk about one of my coaches being an ex-monk. His name's Dan Dapani. I talked to Dan Dapani a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's in New York, uh, holed up in, a, in an apartment in New York. And, and talking about you, right? The last chapter is all about you. Man in the mirror, Brett. Perfect, right? So the objective of all of this, right? As you read the book, The Wealthy Account. How to earn more than a million dollars profit per partner while working less than 500 client delivery hours, right? Uh, someone asked before, and the chat's been going pretty heavy. We'll get the transcript in a little bit. Um, how do we implement this? Well, you can self-implement for sure, um, but I, I would like to help you do this, right? Uh, I have a limited number of coaching um, spaces, places right now, and I'm coaching in Australia, uh, New Zealand, ANZ. I'm coaching in North America, USA, Canada, and I'm also just starting to coach in Europe as well. So if you want some more direct help and you're roughly more than a million in revenue now, you know, if you're a little bit under, let's talk about that. You've got more than 100 business clients and you're ambitious. I would love to help you, right? Let's start a conversation of how myself and my team can help you achieve these sort of results that we spoke of, right? In no time flat. If you want some direct help and you're ready now, just pop yes into the chat and we'll be back in touch. We'll have a face-to-face -face meeting, a Zoom meeting, of course, um, and we'll, we'll see if what I'm doing is actually gonna work for you. So just pop yes into the chat and come back to you. Awesome, Peter, Michelle, we'll get in touch with you after this, but to, to directly help you implement all of this and, and really help you make a difference to your firm. Uh, Carla will be in touch for sure. We can do it all over the world with Zoom, but we do it face to face as well. I'll explain that um, uh, as, as we go, right? So as we, as we meet up. So team, hope you enjoy that. Hope you enjoyed um, the webinar. Hope you learned some things. Maybe got a bit of inspiration. Maybe you, um, Get, got a um, maybe a reboot on some things you already heard about. Oh, I must do that. Uh, but my intention is that uh, you had a good time, you learned some new ideas, and really, when you implement these ideas, right? When you implement, and keep, we'll keep it open, right? Keep the chat open if you've got some questions. Um, when you implement these ideas, life will never be the same again. Life will never, you will build a business that. It's designed your way, a business of your dreams, and life's going to change for the better. 
So team, thank you. Life will never be the same again when you implement. Today is not about, tomorrow is about implementation or this afternoon, right? All the best and have fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Gotta play your song at the end. Keep the chat coming, team. Best takeaways, business structure, even if not an accounting firm. Okay, there you go. Put in your best takeaways if you've got one. Love it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Got that. Thank you, Stu, Hadin, Beatrice. Great to have you here, Rakesh. Uh, buy the book now. <laughs> Jamie, you can get it for free right now. We haven't even started selling it yet. Go to robnixon.com and it'll pop up. You get it for free. Um, lots to think about. Rob, you're right. Uh, go to bed now, Manuel. Yes, very good. It's what time is it? Half past 11. No, half past, yeah, in uh, Netherlands. But 10.30 in the UK, yeah, I get it. Awesome webinar. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, good on you, Colin. Bedtime. <laughs> cool. What a cool webinar. That was fun. Sounds a little complicated. Well, life's complicated, Zishan. Right. Uh, are the slides downloadable? I have to look at that, Damien. Uh, lots of energy, Abby. Yeah. Uh, good night from home. I'm getting people from the Netherlands. I think I've four from the Netherlands online, which is cool. Good morning from Australia. Yes, Campbell, right? The sun is up. It's now 7.30. We're wrapping up. Portugal, Ricardo. Good night. Uh, we work with the whole, Zishan, we work with the whole leadership team the partners uh, and the business managers, but uh, partners must be engaged. Atul, good day from Canada, 5.30 p.m. You must be in uh, Eastern Canada, at all. All right. I'm gonna sh close it off, get you the goodies, all the best team, um, and we'll stop the screen share. Boom, 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 and boom. Team, I hope you enjoyed that. Looking forward to uh, working with a few of you and communicating with you all as well and getting so much for um, Out of the Book also. All the best, team, uh, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're coming from. Bye-bye.